Mm. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the IPS webinar um, today. Netva, can you uh, start the screen? Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Sanho Tree. I'm a fellow here at IPS. Uh, and um, I've been working on drug policy for the uh, past two decades or so. But before that, I was a military and diplomatic historian in the 1990s at IPS, uh, studying World War II and uh, a lot of geopolitics. Uh, and it's also when I first met our, our guest today, Jeremy Bigwood. Um, so I've known Jeremy for quite a few years, um, in wearing many hats, by the way. Um, before I knew him in the 70s, he was actually a published uh, researcher, mycologist, um, uh, published studies on psychedelic literature, which I work on drug policy these days. It's been a, it's weird discovering that side of him. Um, it's just an incredible uh, wealth of knowledge. Uh, but for many, many decades, he was a photojournalist um, uh, covering Latin America, a lot of conflicts in Central America and Colombia, where I've done a lot of work with Jeremy. Um, and so we've kept in touch over the years. And recently, Jeremy uh, got in touch with me and said, I'm back. And I said, whoa, back from where? So from Moscow. And I'd known he had gone to study, uh, study Russian for a while, but um, it, it, you know, it was kind of a, a, a weird call to get some, from someone uh, who said they were on the, one of the last flights out of Moscow uh, before, the, before the sanctions really kicked in. And so Jeremy, could you um, give the audience a little background about uh, how it is that you just first decided to go to Moscow and how it is you ended up on one of the last flights back? Well, it all started really when I uh, turned 65 and I decided that I needed to do something very different and uh, uh, keep my brain functioning. So I decided to learn Russian and to see if it could be done at such a late age. And uh, so I started uh, to study Russian at the Russian Cultural Institute. Uh, Russian Cultural Center here in Washington, D.C., which was a Russian government organization. And uh, a, uh, a year later, that, that was in 2016, a year later, I was working, um, I was studying at Moscow State University in Moscow, uh, which is this huge university. Um, and perhaps it's often considered one of the best in, in Russia, and it's an incredible place. And after that, I went to Pushkin Institute uh, during uh, one winter. And then uh, most recently, I was getting my certification of uh, Russian fluency from essentially the Russian government uh, through uh, Ruslab, which, is, uh, which I'm plugging as one of the best places to learn Russian. Um, I have always wanted to go to Russia. Uh, Russian literature for me has been, is, is, is incredibly interesting. Um, I, American literature is good too, but Russian literature is, uh, some of it is just awesome. And uh, I don't use that word like, lightly. Um, after I was in Russia for, uh, well, I, I was there on and off for, for about five years studying and also doing some research in the Russian archives. I also work in the US archives and in the Russian archives. And in uh, the Russian archives were actually open uh, during this COVID period, when the U.S. archives were closed and are still pretty much closed, they're, they're half open right now. Um, so uh, I went to Russia last um, December and was there until uh, the 2nd of March. Um, and so I was there in the lead up to the invasion of Ukraine or the special military operation as they call it. And um, I have been able to watch in Russia, I've been able to watch it change from a moderately authoritarian state 
which it was when I first visited in 2017, uh, where there were demonstrations. There was a pretty active free press, but uh this was after the death of Boris Nemtsov so political assassinations had been going on but but uh Navalny was going strong at the time uh with his anti-corruption investigations um essentially it was a pretty vibrant place although there was behind everything there was a uh, a, a sort of authoritarian uh, a, a state that was a little scary, but not too present in everyday life. Uh, as the years progressed, it got more and more authoritarian and, uh, and more religious too. Um, one of the things about Russia that people miss is that it is a a very religious country. Um, even, I mean, when you take the bus uh, in the city and you pass cathedrals, people will be crossing themselves. And uh, you don't really see that in many other places. I mean, you see it in Latin America occasionally, but for a country that was communist for so long, you don't, uh, it, it, it's, it's very strange to see such religiosity. Uh, culturally, too, there's, it's very interesting because uh, superstition is still very strong there. Uh, people, um, uh, people will cross the street to avoid black cats. Uh, I've, I've seen that, that's crazy, but it happens. And uh, I've seen it with my own eyes and uh, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, the 70 or so years of communism really uh, didn't eradicate that kind of stuff, religion or superstition or popular superstition. And uh, the religious part, one of the things that Putin apparently was doing is uh, after the Iron Curtain fell, uh, there was a lot of gangsterism, a lot of, uh, uh, there was a, the, 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 the vulture capitalists came in. Uh, a lot of this was, you could say it was the US's fault to a certain degree. Um, and uh, basically people, uh, dropped a lot of the positive elements of communism. And there were positive elements. Uh, there, uh, uh, the social welfare state that it had were, in my opinion, quite positive. And these were all dropped. And uh, the social welfare state still exists, but not nearly as strongly as it did before the, 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 uh, the fall of uh, communism. And, and, and in, the, in place of that, Putin has been able to uh, uh, bring back the church, give it a lot of money, and the church functions to support the government uh, very much so and uh, is, is a very strong element in the country. I'm rambling here. So uh, it's interesting when, uh, when you talk about the welfare state, you know, there are, there are, you see in Russian media today, people saying, oh, we got through worse. We've been through, you know, this special period, not awful period. This. But in those eras, they had the welfare state. It was done under a socialist or communist system. Right. Uh, but now you're very much on your own without that social safety net uh, to try to get through these sanctions, right? It's a different experience. I, I imagine it, it, it appears to be a different experience. Now, some things have survived very well. Uh, public transportation is extremely good in, in, in Russia, in Moscow, and, and much better than in Washington or New York. Uh, that, that's good. That was operating 
throughout, every, I, I, I mean, since, uh, since before World War II, it's been moving along pretty well. Um, the public health system uh, has been gutted in some places, but when I got COVID in Moscow, uh, it was right there and very effective in uh, essentially uh, telling me what the rules were and what I should expect and, uh, and setting up things like uh, uh, a doctor comes over and tells you how, uh, essentially how to get food delivered to you if you're in quarantine, which, which I was. Um, so some of those things are still very much alive, but the Putin government has been moving against them. Uh, the age, at which you get social security, that which you retire was moved up under Putin. Um, and that got a lot of people very upset. Um, so some of the, the, some of the thing, the positive aspects of communism are still there, some of them, but Putin himself is very much uh, anti-Bolshevik, anti-Leninist, uh, and he will say so. He, in fact, he blames uh, the existence of Ukraine as a separate state on Lenin. And, and uh, uh, he finds, uh, uh, basically, I mean, Putin, if you look at him, he's really a religio-fascist. He has, uh, he's very similar in, in, in a very real sense to uh, Mussolini and the Spanish Belangis fascism. Um, and communism or socialism is, is considered, he considers it to be his enemy. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this, uh, to, to have this talk was because uh, I have a feeling that many of my friends on the left in the United States and in, in Latin America, uh, they, they, what they see is Russia helping Venezuela, Cuba, et cetera. And they identify Russia as part of sort of the global left still. And it's not at all. It is a right-wing, uh, 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 very fascist government that is, is uh, religio-fascist on the inside and imperialist on the outside. My uh, colleague, uh, John Pfeffer, you know, wrote a piece about um, authoritarianism in Russia. And you know, he just outlined a checklist uh, mm -hmm. of fascism, which I think is really interesting to, to review. You know, it's authoritarianism, militarism, extreme nationalism, corporatism, and far-right social policy. Um, that's the, the fascist mm -hmm. side of the spectrum we're talking about here. Um, when you mentioned um, uh, uh, the church, um, I don't, one, one, one of the earlier uh, pogroms, if you want to call it, that, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that, that Putin's government organized was against gays. Um, mm -hmm. and has been going uh, hot and heavy for many years now. And I think most Americans don't realize when they hear about these horrible laws in Florida and Texas and others, don't say gay states, that mm -hmm. literally came out of Russia, right? I mean, that was part of the deal with the, with the church. Could you elaborate more on the, the role of the church and, and all this? And yeah, the, 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 the church's role in Russia is, uh, well, one of the things that people, probably don't know is that Putin has talked about Moscow being the new Rome uh, to replace Ro Constantinople and Rome uh, as the center of Christianity. And that Christianity is not a Christianity that is the Christianity of say liberation theology. It is a very harsh Christianity much closer to the Inquisition. Uh, and uh, part of that ideology and part of Putin's ideology, even amongst people who are, who are pro-Putin and not uh, 
Russian Orthodox, part of that ideology is a very strong anti uh, uh, gay component and the feeling and it's it it almost feels like the people who were against gays here in the United States in the 1960s. Uh, and and basically they have the church on their side they they'll they'll have psychiatrists on their side and uh, they will attack people there was a, a major uh, a, a major gay singer who used to be on all of the russian uh, shows uh, and uh, and he was interviewed as saying you know russia is a gay friendly place and uh, uh, there was a propaganda show against him on state TV, attacking him and, and uh, exposing him as that, and then having all of these mothers call in and say, you can't have gay propaganda in our country. And uh, all he said was that it was gay friendly. Uh, uh, it, it is, that was his perception. Of course, he was a star and, and, and everything, but basically it is a nightmare for sexual minorities, uh, it's a nightmare for anyone who's 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 very different and not uh, towing the line. Uh, basically, fascist countries like you to be part of almost a military or militarized uh, organization, which is the state, and you've got to march with that. Uh, and, and you uh, and you you can't can't be against it. One of the things that is very interesting about Russia is that it isn't just the propaganda on on the uh, radio and on TV, on state TV and state radio, that affects people. It's also cultural. Uh, Russia has made a lot of movies. And they're all very patriotic movies, or at least most of them are very patriotic, especially those that have been funded by, partially funded by the state. And uh, their movies, a lot, a lot of their movies are about World War II, and they keep refighting World War II in their minds. And the world has moved on from that. And, but yet it remains a focus of, 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 of Russian movie making and Russian song too. Uh, it, uh, it Russian popular music uh, will have singers who will be singing songs about World War II and, uh, and how they defeated the Nazis, which they did. And then I was just watching Russian TV uh, minutes before we, we, we started this. And, uh, on Russian TV, uh, there were interviews about uh, interviews of people at a demonstration, pro-Putin demonstration. It wasn't very large, but it was a pro-Putin demonstration. And everyone interviewed was talking about uh, eradicating the Nazis in Ukraine. And this idea is very strange because if you go to Ukraine, it, I mean, it's there's a Jewish president. It doesn't seem. I mean, even the right sector in Ukraine, if you compare them to the Russians, the Russians are eminently more fascistic on every level. Right sector doesn't. I mean, right sector doesn't attack a free press. It doesn't attack elections. It it only gets two percent, two point five percent of the vote. It uh, doesn't even make it into the parliament. Uh, but in, in Russia, uh, it, 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 Russian fascism is very strong. And so people who are upset about fascism or want to get rid of fascism should want to get uh, to, to stop the Russians and not stop the Ukrainians. Yeah, it's a it's a, an odd thing to have to explain to some leftists that there are actually more socialists and more progressives in the so-called NATO or, or the Western states than there are in the CSTO, the, the, the Russian equivalent of, of NATO. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you just go down the, 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 the very rather objective checklist 
right. um, it's not that difficult to, to see. Um, but uh, you talked about the, um, uh, the cultural changes. Uh, you also have a, an interesting connection to Alexander Dugan, um, who is often referred to as Putin's philosopher. Uh, there's been very little reporting about him in the United States, but it kind of reminds me of the early days of the Iraq War in 2003, when mm -hmm. neocons, uh, you know, they, 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 some reference Leo Strauss as being the neocon philosopher. So everyone went out and tried to buy all the Leo Strauss mm -hmm. writings that they could find to try to discern where Bush was going to go with the Iraq War. Uh, but could you talk a little bit about Dugan and how you came to yeah. the Yeah, but basically, um, I started to read Dugan. Uh, someone brought him up when I was uh, taking my, it was only a once, once a week class at the Russian Cultural uh, Center here in Washington, DC. And I immediately uh, bought several, the only books of his that were available in the United States. In fact, I have one right here. And you will note that his symbol is very similar to the, the Spanish uh, phalangist fascist symbol. Um, but uh, he, uh, amazingly, when I went, went to Russia on my first trip there, I got involved in a relationship with a woman whose best friend had been married to Dugan. And so I got a little bit of an inside story from that. But Dugan, apart from that, Dugan is, is someone who comes from a tradition, which I would say is a pan-Slavic tradition, which even Tolstoy was writing about. It's extreme right-wing nationalist uh, uh, Russian sentiment. And basically Dugan represents that sentiment today. And uh, Alexander Dugan, you can find him on the, the internet um, or you can even find his Facebook site. Uh, he, uh, for years, has been saying that Ukraine needs to be part of Russia again. Uh, he's been saying that uh, Ukraine really wasn't a, um, uh, it really isn't a country. Uh, it was an artifact. And essentially everything that he has said in the past, Putin says now. And so that is why he's often considered Putin's philosopher, Putin's brain. Uh, there have been other uh, terms like that used for him. But he's a very strong influence on Putin. Now, uh, other people say that the church is a stronger influence on Putin, but I, I don't believe that. I think it works the other way. Uh, Putin influences the church and is influenced by Dugan. Uh, Dugan's language is a little too radical sometimes for, uh, for use by, a, a, the, by the dictator, the, the major politician. Uh, so he essentially tones it down a little bit but it is essentially uh, Dugan speaking. And Dugan represents again, this whole concept of Russian nationalism, but it's not just about Russia, it's Russian empire nationalism. And uh, Dugan has written in, in various places, the size that he would like to see the Russian empire be built into again. And it definitely includes Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, uh, and Georgia. And, and it's, it's much bigger. And in some cases, uh, he, he has even written about it extending all the way to Dublin. So <laughs> this is, you, you know, basically, this, uh, this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with like a, a, a very imperialist ideology. And essentially uh, he's saying that Russian culture will only be safe if, if Russia is much bigger. So and, this, and, okay. and so, so this, this brings up the whole thing about Ukraine, whether or not some kind of deal could have been made before the invasion whereby U Ukraine is neutral and then cedes certain territories. I, I've been to Crimea, Crimea is indeed Russian. Uh, 
it's been Russian for a long time. It's not really Ukrainian, but uh, 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 Donbass, that's up. Yeah, it all belongs to the Mongols originally, but, but we won't yeah, go there. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. So you own it. So. Okay. <laughs> Sano owns it. Uh, okay. Uh, but anyway, you got, um, you've got this situation where, uh, uh, where before the war started, there was a possibility that Ukraine uh, would would declare itself neutral, or at least that was the hope, and then the Russians would back off and, uh, and, and uh, there would be some kind of deal made in the Don, uh, Donbass, which is the eastern part of Ukraine, um, uh, close to the uh, Black Sea. Um, but if you listen to Dugan, that's not what the Russians want at all. Uh, uh, the Russians didn't didn't want again the 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 idea that uh, Ukraine would never join NATO, that it would be neutral and all that. That's that's uh, that's what La, uh, Lavrov and other people were arguing on the Russian side, but that's not what Putin has been saying or Dugin has been saying. Essentially, uh, they think that right now Ukraine should be part of Russia and so, that Ukrainians don't exist. Yeah, that's an interesting discourse for a country that occupies 11 time zones and seems to think it needs a buffer zone <laughs> against other countries. Um, uh, the, but uh, the, the, your point about refighting World War II constantly um, mm -hmm. and, and how prominently it figures in, in Russian society and history uh, the significance of May 9th. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, uh, both in terms of, of, of you know, the national celebrations, but also as an impending date that people are talking about in terms of what's Putin gonna do for May 9th, which is when they observe the, the victory in over Nazi mm -hmm. Germany day in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, 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 there are some rumors that he's given an order that whatever major cities you can't uh, seize by May 9th to, to do as much damage, to flatten them as much as possible, um, because of the significance of that deadline, uh, it seems, or, or you know, it would be embarrassing for him not to have something to show off. Um, could you talk about the role of that? In, in, in well, I think I think he he probably will have. Um, I uh, I was going to say Guernica because it's in your background. <laughs> he, he will probably have Mariupol uh, to show off, uh, which has been completely. Well, it hasn't completely flattened, but it is not at least 90% flattened. Uh, but he also has a huge embarrassment in the sinking of this ship in the Black Sea, which was like the most important ship in the Russian Navy in the Black Sea. And it's pretty irreplaceable. Uh, it has the best, uh, it had the best uh, uh, rockets on it for attacking Adessa, if they wanted to invade from the sea, um, it's it was a very important thing, and it is being dealt with in Russia as if it was just merely a fire on board that it wasn't hit by a rocket, and it was pretty clearly hit by a rocket. Um, and, and interesting it, because they're also calling for like bloodthirsty revenge against Ukraine for. Right accidental fire on their ship. Right, on their ship. No, no, the whole thing. I mean, if if you've got half a brain, even if you're in Russia and you're watching the news, if you've got half a brain, you can see all the contradictions. But people are scared because it is a totalitarian state right now. And and I should point out that it it was a seriously authoritarian state when I got there in December. And January and February, it got a little worse and a little worse and a little worse. And then February 24th, it became a completely fascist, religio-fascist state. Uh, and what day did you end up leaving uh, Moscow? Uh, uh, March 2nd. And what kind of, what, what can you uh, describe about the changes? Okay, okay. What, what was happening, what was happening after, after the invasion, most people didn't think, uh, most, most of the, uh, sort of opposition people who I would talk to 
before the uh, before the invasion, most people did not think that he would actually invade. They thought that that would be absolutely stupid. That he didn't know what he. I, I mean, that it was all a big threat, and. Uh, and you know uh, what's kind of weird is that Joe Biden was right, and I, you know, they were actually going to invade. Um, and uh, 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 basically, what what happened is right after the invasion, there were some sanctions, and those sanctions caused in my neighborhood when people wanted to get money out of the bank there were lines at the ATMs and then the ATMs would run out of money and then people would be pissed off. So that was the, the first thing. Uh, luckily, uh, I had uh, already uh, changed some money before that because it would, would have been very hard to do it a after that. Um, but the hardship started and then already, uh, Things like uh, I needed to buy ink for my printer there, and I was not able to uh, get that ink. And the reason given was sanctions. Uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but that's that's why these stores didn't have it. And I went to several stores. Um, you had to buy a whole new printer if, if, if you wanted to get the ink uh, that came with the printer. Uh, they had the printer, but they didn't have the uh, ink kind of thing. But there were serious shortages. And as I was leaving, uh, stores were putting up signs saying you can only buy so much sugar. And uh, the day, uh, two days before I left, uh, I was going to leave uh, March 1st. And uh, the day before that, I got an email and a text message from Aeroflot, which was the Russian Airlines, which was a very good airline, by the way. And uh, it said, uh, your plane has been canceled. And there, of course, there was no overflight over Europe at the time. Anywhere in Europe, you were not, uh, Russian planes were not allowed to fly over. And then uh, the Russians responded by saying, uh, European airlines cannot fly into Russia. Um, and so uh, Aeroflot closed down for a day when they reevaluate, they, they tried to reevaluate the situation. And I called up the next morning at 5.30 and I actually got through to someone and they got me a ticket out through one of three of the only places where you could go. And most tickets, uh, most flights to those places were completely full uh, because every, a lot of Russians wanted to leave. They, uh, they did not want to stick around, uh, especially people who were like related to the opposition. Uh, they had to leave because of the, I mean, if you publish something, if you were published something on Facebook saying that it's a war, and not a special military operation, you could go to jail for 15 years and they do prosecute people. They actually do do that. And uh, uh, it, it, people who are even related to people who do that or people who find a post in, uh, made outside of the country and then post it to their Facebook page, uh, you know, could also be prosecuted. So a lot of people, this was, a, a very dangerous situation for the opposition. So a lot of people actually left. So and, uh, and I was able to leave through Dubai, um, which uh, which which was very good. Now there's still, I mean, there's still good journalists there, and I have some friends who who are still there, Americans who work for companies that are still operating there. There aren't that many companies operating there, but the ones that are have have a certain amount of Americans there. But these are people generally who are extremely apolitical or will toe the official line um, uh, be, because their livings depend on it. Well, I, I'm glad you made it out of, uh, out of Russia uh, when you did, because it could be very risky to fly on Russian planes uh, very shortly now, it seems. Uh, a good friend of mine works in the aviation industry and 
you know, Aeroflot flies mostly uh, Airbus and, and Boeing planes, not, not old Soviet airplanes. Um, mm -hmm. And the, not only have those two companies shut off access to the maintenance manuals, which are online these days, mm -hmm. but they've cut them off from spare parts. And my understanding is that most of those Russian uh, airlines were serviced in Germany and other places outside of Russia, uh, mm -hmm. where they had more expertise and more engineers. Uh, and so it's going to, even if they can cannibalize the remaining uh, Boeings and, and Airbus planes, without those online manuals to know how to assemble, reassemble those millions of parts, it's going to be very, very risky and problematic, I, I think. But I want to talk a little bit about sanctions because, uh, you know, when I worked as a World War II historian, one of the, the objectives of the war, if you couldn't uh, defeat the fascists on the battlefield uh, right away, the other thing they could do was wage strategic warfare. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was to go after the enemy's economy to, to, to stop their capacity to wage war. And so the allies expended tremendous effort building these long range bomber fleets to mm -hmm. blow up uh, German ball bearings, to blow up the oil sector, to blow up this sector, that sector, to try to make it impossible for them to continue producing weapons and waging war. And it didn't really work that well uh, with the exception of the oil industry attacks like the ball bearing factories they tried to bomb mm. in Germany. Hundreds of bombers flew out, lots of them got shot down. And we found out after the war through the US Strategic Bombing Survey that most of those bombs in World War II never landed anywhere near their intended targets, sometimes miles away. Um, it was simply impossible to do accurate bombing back then and, and mm -hmm. still now to, many, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to a great extent. But um, what these sanctions, these unprecedented levels of sanctions have done is something that those strategic warfare uh, planners could only dream of, which is that they've managed to shut down production lines of tanks, of airplanes, of any kind of advanced military equipment, partly because Russia didn't produce a lot of the milling equipment and, and the precision manufacturing equipment to produce the components necessary for these very complicated weapon systems. Mm -hmm. It was simply easier to buy them from Korea, from Japan, just to order it because it was a, an open economy back then. And now they can't do that and their spare parts are gone. Um, and it becomes almost impossible to get those kinds of ma machinery and, and, and spare parts to keep those production lines open. Uh, and of course, one hopes that sanctions don't impact medicines or, or cause you know, hunger or you know, hurt the, the general population as a whole, that should not be the objective of sanctions. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the first time, and it's never been attempted before, and I doubt the stars will ever align where you get this degree of international cooperation to cut things off. But it seems like they've managed to, to, to really put a, a stop to the capacity to wage not just further war, uh, or at least produce new weapon systems, but to finance it. So uh, the Arctic, for instance, Putin yesterday mm -hmm put out an extraordinary plea uh, that, you know, please co 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 cooperate with us on Arctic development because most of the new hydrocarbons, the oil and gas reserves are in the Arctic as are many of the new mineral reserves and they simply don't have the technology domestically to get at those. They need Western cooperation. And so even if they wanted to fund their way out of this, the, these sanctions, they can't do that because they, they, they can't get at the oil. Um, so what have you noticed uh, just in talking with people or, or about you know, the, 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 the impact of sanctions on people's daily lives and, and how do you think that's gonna play out? Well, I, I think that, uh, well, very clearly the sanctions have had a very strong effect. I, uh, I still have a uh, tutor in Chelyabinsk in uh, uh, east of the uh, Urals in Russia and she's a school teacher, that's her, her job. She teaches in a Russian school. And uh, apparently the prices of paper, everything have doubled or gone a lot higher. So it is having an effect on the, uh, on the population, which I'm not sure whether I really like, uh, but uh, if that's happening, it's definitely happening in other areas too. And I think that this has been very effective. I, I am a little concerned about its effect on ordinary citizens because it might push, the, it could work either way. They could demand a change in government or they could support the government more. And right now they seem to be supporting the government more. And so 
in the case of citizens, uh, I'm not sure it's very good, but in the case of their industry or their, their weapons industry, it's extremely effective. Uh, the other thing is, is that we really, we've only been at this for what, uh, a month and a half? Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we're not going to really see what, what the, the effects are for another couple of months at least you know, the, 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 the ongoing effects. I imagine that uh, even with these technical um, products that you were talking about, that there's still a stash of those right now, but that will run out very soon and we'll see what happens. Also, I mean, the actual paper that my tutor was talking about, that's gonna run out too, <laughs> so. Uh, you, you know, so we'll see. We'll see how this pans out. But basically, um, basically, there is a war going on between Russia and the West right now. And uh, in a war, you you fight, and uh, you know, and and sanctions is is part of it. In World War II, uh, we had the Office of Economic Warfare in the State Department. Uh, we don't have that anymore. Uh, Treasury is doing that work, uh, but uh, I think it's having. I think it is having an effect, and it's just. I, I mean, you gotta. Uh, when you have an enemy like that, like this, that will invade another country, uh, will shield its own population from real information about the invasion. Uh, you, you gotta hit them anywhere you can. And so sanctions are, are, are a good way of doing that. Exactly. In I mean, case, the Department has been turning the screws on Cuba my entire life. And so when they want to impose sanctions, they know which screws to turn. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, it has, hasn't been that effective with Cuba <laughs> over all these years, has it? So, so and, and indeed, it may have made the situation a lot worse in Venezuela, too. Uh, you know, for, for normal people. Uh, I think in the case of Russia, I think it's pretty well targeted and it's pretty clear that if Russia stops invading and backs off and comes to kind of some kind of deal saying, okay, well, Duganism is out. We're not going to uh, invade Europe. We're going to do this and that. Uh, we're going to like behave like a more normal country or a more, uh, I mean, Russia's always going to be antagonistic to the West, but we're not going to be invading other countries. If that were to happen, these sanctions could be dropped very rip rapidly. Now, uh, it seems to me this is uh, an incredible moment for progressives in the United States, uh, especially a progressive ca caucus in Congress to seize on um, Pentagon spending, which I know sounds counterintuitive that we're in a time of war, there's all these weapons that are being procured now for this for Ukraine, but at the same time, so much of that obscene military budget has been premised on Cold War, assum Cold war assumptions about the mighty red, uh, or, or now the Russian army and the military, mm -hmm. how, how powerful they are and how uh, state of the art and, you know, and, and we see the parades on, on May 9th uh, and how shiny their vehicles are. We see them at, the, you know, when they're 10 feet tall at their, at their best and we right. see the, what they want to show us. Now that we've seen how they're actually performing in the field and yeah. it's the yeah. Keystone Cops, it, it is just unbelievable screw ups, corruption, inefficiency, lack of training, lack of unit mm -hmm. cohesion. Uh, almost a non-existent NCO, uh, non-commissioned officer corps, which is the backbone of most militaries around right, the world. Right. You mm -hmm. need your sergeants or your corporals to actually mm -hmm. get things that actually happen mm -hmm. on the ground, right. which is why right. you have so many, you know, Russian generals and, 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 and colonels, leaders, officers going to the front, waving their right. arms around, trying to get things done. And of course, Ukrainian snipers know, oh, that's the one you shoot first, right. Right. <laughs> which is how they end up with, you know, I think seven dead generals yes. now, which yes, is that's just incredible. never happens yes. in wartime. Yeah. 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 Um, Part of that uh, was a result of corruption. 
uh, mm -hmm. early on, back in 2019, there was a scandal in Moscow about procurement of, of radio equipment, commun secure communications mm -hmm. upgrade for the Russian military. They were, they've been modernizing their military for 10 years, right? And well, it turns out that the, the Colonel General and, a, and another general involved in this uh, were prosecuted for uh, substituting cheap Chinese radios, walkie talkies, basically, unencrypted radios for use by the military. Um, this, to the day I die, I will not screaming, stop screaming about this because I just, it makes me want to pull my hair out. We've, everyone has known this since World War II, right. that right. your communications are absolutely vital. Even yeah. if you don't have encrypted radios, you at least use code words and, and, right. and call signs so the enemy can't figure out, you know, who's talking to whom. But and yet we have open case. transmissions with the Russian you know, uh, units talking to each other. It's like, oh, I thought I was uh, code sign alpha. No, you're this and that. And unbelievable. And so yeah. we know that they substituted a lot of the procurement money for things like radios, for things like all the all this high end equipment. That has been corrupted. They, they, you know, they found cardboard where Kevlar should be. They found, you know, uh, old cheap Chinese tires on our vehicles, which is why their vehicles keep having their tires fall off. They haven't been maintained, uh, and they can't go off road because it's the Raswitica, the mud season, mm -hmm. um, and 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 the communications are compromised, which is how the U.S. is able to predict so accurately for once uh, exactly. They knew exactly what the Russians were up to because they were broadcasting this stuff, and so. We still have a Pentagon budget based on fighting, um, you know, this incredible superpower. That uh, doesn't exist, right. Can you talk a little bit more about corruption and, and the cultures of corruption in various ways? Corruption is very, very hard. Um, I, I never saw, I heard about corruption in Russia a lot, but I've never actually I've never actually experienced it in my face, like someone asking for money, like or a, a cop in Mexico asking for money. That has happened a lot. Uh, but uh, what I have seen is uh, there, uh, Russians have been complaining. One of the things that, um, uh, that Russians complain about is corruption in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, particularly. Uh, with the city government. And uh, on my first ride into Moscow with a taxi driver from the airport in 2017, uh, the driver, and my, my Russian was really bad, so I was uh, working the cell phone a lot uh, to get, <laughs> to, to try and figure out exactly what he was saying. But he went on and on and on about the corruption in the city about how the mayor was corrupt. And this was someone, by the way, who uh, Stephen Cohen had praised, um, you know, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, every Russian taxi driver who I ever took a taxi ride with, uh, we'd, whenever we'd pass a street that was being dug up, uh, he would complain about corruption. So corruption is really on people's minds a lot. And, and it is that corruption that essentially uh, stimulated the whole Navalny movement because they were documenting it extremely well. Yeah. Hello, uh, Kitty. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so any, anyway, corruption is, is, is a major uh, is a major issue, but did I see that personally? No. Now, the other thing is, is I was in Crimea for a while, uh, a, a, a few years ago, uh, actually it was 2019, and uh, people talked about the corruption in Ukraine, and Ukraine actually has a reputation for much more corruption than even Russia has. And I'm not sure how, how that's going to be dealt with after, after uh, I, I imagine that there'll be some kind of negotiated settlement in a couple of years, and uh, Ukraine will get to keep most of its territory, if not all of it. Uh, and, but then the issue in, in Ukraine will be corruption. In Russia, um, there's corruption it comes from the people 
around Putin. And I don't see that changing until the regi regime changes. And uh, I'm not sure when that will happen. If, if uh, Putin has his way, he'll be in power for at least another 10 years. Well, there's a, actually, a, a, I want to encourage people to ask questions. We still have a few minutes left. And there is a question uh, from uh, Jerry Kay, any chance of a coup? Um, and uh, it's interesting that uh, Defense Minister Shoigu had apparently another heart attack yesterday or is rumored to have had a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was the number two. Um, what's, the, what's the inner circle look like and what, what are the chances, uh, you think, of any chance of either a military or a palace coup or a popular uprising? Or I know it's really hard to predict these things, but. Yeah, popular uprising, no, because just about every anyone who was involved who, who was involved in the opposition in the past has left the country. Uh, and and those that were in the opposition who aren't in jail are keeping their mouths shut. And and there's there's really no way because you can't go on the street. If you go on the street, you'll be arrested if any group gathers. So they'll be arrested. A uh, palace coup um, that is possible, but I think more likely is that in the case, if, if more things happen like the uh, uh, missile ship being uh, sunk, if, if, if there are more ships like that being sunk or more serious problems, I think we'll, we could see Shai Gugo. Um, but what would happen is Putin would remain in power, but he would blame other people and then they would go. And then that, you know, I don't see- Out the window, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, out the window. I really, I think he's, I mean, he's covered his, he's covered his, uh, well, I was gonna say, yeah. He's, he's covered himself very well, just like Stalin did. And, and, and uh, you know, there were some attempts against Stalin too that failed. Uh, so I, I really don't think that, um, I really don't think that there's going to be uh, a, a coup it, right now. It just doesn't seem, it seems to me like he still has 80% support or 70% support. And even if it's really 50, it's enough. Uh, it's more than our president has, uh, for instance, you know, so uh, I don't think uh, I don't think that if he were overthrown, I don't see how you would um, how how you would be popular after that. Uh, so I think we got this guy for for a while. Now things could change very rapidly if a few ship if if everything really fails really big time during this next push, which is coming, which people are calling Plan B. Uh, then and 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 the economic situation gets really really bad. Um, we could um, we could see something like that, but I don't see it right now. Um, and indeed, most Russians remember that even uh, most Russians remember the time. Well, some Russians even remember the Second World War. Things were really bad then. And a lot of people uh, remember the time period after the fall of the wall. And that was really bad too. Putin actually, as part, one of the, well, one of the positive things that Putin did is that he did put, put the economy back together and he did grow the country. And uh, a lot of Russians, uh, in the last few years have been living better than Russians have ever lived. So this is something to consider. Yeah, uh, about that, in, in terms of uh, when, when people in the US think about Russians, they think of people in Moscow, they think of uh, Caucasian uh, mm. folks. Uh, as you mentioned, Russia is an empire. It, it does span 11 time zones. There are uh, many Russians who are not uh, uh, Caucasian. Um, and the BBC uh, recently, yesterday, I think, did a study of um, uh, obituaries of mm -hmm. people who've uh, been reported dead in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. 
And they found that overwhelmingly it was recruits from the provinces, from Siberia, such all these other places. Mm -hmm. And they found almost zero from Moscow, from the Moscow region. So could you talk a little bit about ethnic minorities and, and paying the price for this war and how they perceive uh, things you know, relative to, to people in the Moscow region, for instance? Yeah, Moscow historically has always been uh, it's always been harder to move to, harder to, to exist in than other places. And there's been a sort of a selection of people, uh, uh, selection by various governments going back to czarist times of who was in Moscow and who wasn't in Moscow. And you used to, uh, if you lived in Moscow, you used to have a special permit to come in. And uh, the, the Bolsheviks got rid of that, but the, uh, a little later, they had to reinstall that. I don't, I don't know why. But basically, uh, Russia has uh, it is is quite diverse, and although a lot of that diversity, a lot of those people really do feel Russian, and indeed, one of the things that's very interesting to me is that there isn't much of an accent change amongst people from like from Vladivostok or, or people from say uh, Sochi. Uh, they can, I, I mean, they're, they're, I can understand both of them very clearly and th they don't have very strong accents. Neither has a very strong accent. In the United States, that's very different. Mm. So there is sort of a homogenization. Now, the people who go to war are not, generally not the people from Moscow. Now, a lot of people from Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, and places like that, uh, who are much better off than the rest of the population, is Moscow is a very rich town. Uh, and uh, essentially the cities since Tsarist times have been much richer than the countryside. And, and uh, uh, in cases like uh, in Moscow, you don't find too many kids who want to go into the army. People want to find ways to get out of going into the army. Whereas in the other parts of the country, kids are inducted into the army. And generally, they're not very well-educated kids. They're not receiving hardly any money. And it's not a very pleasant life. Now, if you're in Moscow and you do go into the army, you go through a, a school like West Point, a West Point type school, and you get into the uh, officialdom, you get into the higher ranks. Uh, and the Russian system, uh, it is true that uh, the people who are dying are um, are, are people from the provinces, essentially. My tutor last weekend uh, took a uh, mashrut, which is a, a van to where her mother lived out in the countryside. And she lives in Chelyabinsk. Uh, my tutor lives in Chelyabinsk. And in that van, they were transporting a coffin with someone killed in Ukraine. And so it it is being noticed, but people were very patriotic about it. You know, this was the big fight against Nazism. The other thing is, is that Russians have been watching these World War II movies. That's what they make in, in Russia. You don't see them here because they're all in Russian. Uh, but there's sort of, everyone is sort of fighting the war against the Nazis again in their own minds. And it's, it's very strange, uh, you know, it's a strange reality. And uh, we don't, I've never seen anything like that to compare it to in the United States. It's interesting although, though. Although the, the sort of the right-wing pro-war types that you meet salesmen in, in stores and stuff like that in, in, in Moscow, they remind me a lot of the American right that was very much pro the war in Vietnam, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, like rednecky 
that that kind of person. It's interesting you mentioned the World War II movies. There is one uh, Russian movie from, I think it's Russian, from 2005 called Ninth Company, mm -hmm. uh, which I recommend. It was about Afghanistan and their quagmire, their 10 year quagmire in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that also led to Gorbachev's downfall in many ways and the fall right. of the Soviet Union. Um, so it's an interesting parallel. They've gotten mm -hmm. another quagmire they don't know quite how to get out of. Um, I, we're at the top of our hour, but I wanted to really thank you uh, for spending this time with us, Jeremy, and offering your insights. I understand you're uh, learning Ukrainian now in a crash uh, course. Yes. <laughs> um, you want to talk about what you might be up to, or, or do you want to keep that off? The... Let's keep it off. Let's keep okay. it off. Okay. All right. You're learning Ukrainian. Good. Very good. All okay. right. <laughs> Onwards. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and thanks, Jeremy. Um, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.